So it's 12.02 and uh, we're going to begin. I wanna just take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you joining us here on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Thank you for your presence here today. We are more than 1200 strong. Um, you've all joined us here today to learn more about the current government in Israel and, the, and its potential impact on our community here in Canada. My name is Gail Adelson Markovitz and I'm the national chair of the board of, for the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. Earlier, as I traveled across the country with CJA's president and CEO, Shimon, Shimon Koffler Fogel earlier this year, it became really apparent to us that communities from coast to coast were concerned about the new government in Israel, the coalition led by Netanyahu and its implications for civil status, the judiciary, security in the region, and even the very future of our democratic project in Israel. Many of us believe that Israel is a state of the totality of the Jewish people and not just its citizens. While it is the citizens of Israel who elect their government, that choice has ramifications for many aspects of our partnership and specifically impacts diaspora Jews. We feel that our interests must at the very least be heard if not respected, particularly in those areas where we are impacted. Add to that the uncertainty surrounding the collaborative government, election rhetoric and positions taking leading up to the election and we have the makings of a perfect storm. But we must all remember that positions taken during elections and subsequent decisions made by a government in power are not necessarily the same thing. And we must be cautious and patient as we wait to see how the situation in Israel unfolds. We must leave room for civil and respectful dialogue and difference in opinion. We must be ever mindful that our legitimate criticism may become fodder for our adversaries and will be used against us to further delegitimize the state. Let's keep in mind the theme of this town hall, unity, not uniformity. We will not necessarily agree on everything or share the same opinions, but we must remain united to ensure the absolute right of the existence of a democratic state of Israel is never in jeopardy. Before we get started, I also wanted to mention the upcoming legal conference CJA is putting on. While Israel and the Jewish world have important challenges to face as this town hall will discuss, there are also some bright spots. The Abraham Accords, the peace agreements between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan have fundamentally changed the relationship between Israel and the Arab world. If you are a lawyer, but even if you're not, and you wanna learn more about these developments and earn CLE credits doing so, please register for our annual legal conference in March on March 2nd at the website www.cja.ca. With that said, we are very fortunate to have an outstanding panel here today. And moderating that panel is Yaron Deco. Yaron is the Director for Canada and the Jewish Agency for Israel and a longtime journalist when, when he held several posts, including Washington Bureau Chief for Israel TV and radio outlets. He's interviewed world leaders and has created several television documentaries, including a five-part docu TV documentary, The Israelis, documenting the lives of Israelis living in the US and Canada. We are so very fortunate to have him here today to moderate this discussion. So thank you, Yaron, and I'll let you take it from here. Well, uh, thank you very much, Gail, for the uh, kind introduction. And I'd like to uh, do some uh, quick introduction for our prestigious panelist, Dr. Renat Wilf, is a former member of the Knesset in Israel. She has served as a foreign policy advisor to uh, Mr. Shimon Peres when he served as a vice prime minister. And she's a strategic consultant with McKinsey and and company in New York, uh, New York City, and a general partner with the core corporate venture capital in Israel. Ambassador Mark Regev is currently the chair of the Abba Ibn Institute for Diplomacy of the Reichman University in Israel. Most recently, Ambassador Regev was the Prime Minister's senior advisor for foreign affairs and international communications. He served as Israel's, Israel's ambassador to the United Kingdom from 2016 to 2020, and before as prime minister's advisor and international spokesperson 
for seven years or nine years, sorry, had become one of the Israel's most prominent voices in English speaking world. Following his Aliyah in 1982, 90, sorry, 19, yeah, 1982, Ambassador Regev was an infantry, infantry uh, soldier in the IDF. Welcome both of you, Einat and Mark, and thank you very much for uh, taking the time to participate in this webinar. So let's uh, let's go down into it. Einat, why don't you uh, open up and uh, tell us how you see the new coalition uh, in in Israel, the sixth uh, government of Prime Minister Netanyahu, and uh, what the reaction uh, in Israel has been so far. Why the Israelis are so divided three months, only three months after the democratic elections uh, with the decisive results. And uh, what is the biggest concern generally uh, with this government, Inat? So um, the tragedy of this moment, and I think it is a tragedy, is that Israeli society on a lot of issues uh, is actually not divided. There are wide agreements on issues that used to divide Israeli society, such as the question of the Palestinians or other issues. And actually on those issues, there's a vast middle that is all the way, let's say from half of Shas, including the Likud, way into Lapid, Gantz, labor. Uh, and all these forces could work together to have a centrist, Zionist, moderate government. And yet they are split over issues that uh, are not issues of policy. Even the current judicial reform, I have to share with you, until, about, until it had anything to do with Netanyahu, so until Netanyahu had his own legal issues, the issue of judicial reform interested about 20 people who were deeply passionate about it, they spanned the entire political spectrum. They were on the left and on the right. Uh, and they could have probably came to agreements if you had put those 20 people in a room and asked them to come out with a reform. But now, ever since it became a personal issue to Netanyahu, and in many ways he unleashed uh, Yariv Levine, for whom this is uh, a personal crusade, uh, it's become a divisive issue for Israeli society in the most bizarre way. In the last couple of weeks, I've been in many events, including social events, where people were yelling at each other on how to select judges. Issues that seriously nobody cared about before it became a personal issue for Netanyahu, which really shows that it's not the issue itself that is dividing Israeli society. And what is happening, and I think again, tragic. I remember when it happened in Trump's America, when people said that they cannot sit together for the Thanksgiving table. People would uh, fight with siblings. Uh, friendships would disconnect. And I remember looking at that from afar and thinking people have gone nuts. And now I'm seeing this dynamic takeover Israel where the lines are drawn, people are separated into camps, each side, if you're in one camp, you're supposed to believe 30 things and not anything else. And if you're in the other camp, you're supposed to believe 30 other things. And the people who are attacked most at this moment are people, most prominently our president, who are trying to mediate and moderate. And for me, this is an entire tragedy because it does not rest on real issues that divide a large share of our society. Thank you very much for the uh, opening uh, remarks. Now I'll turn, uh, I turn the uh, ball to you, Mark. How, what is your perspective on the issues right now in Israel? So, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I want to say that I agree with the, with the fundamental point that was made by, by Dr. Wilf. Um, if you look at this most contentious issue, which is being discussed now, which is the judicial reform issue in Israel, it's, it's, it's an issue where a lot of the members of the opposition, the people who are not in this Netanyahu government, have, have for years supported. Um, uh, Giron Saar has supported it, other people on the other side, Beth and Lieberman, of course, has supported it. And yet today we have a polarization in Israel, and, 
an unfortunate polarization. Of course, it's in America too, it's in parts of Europe too, but it's in Israel as well, where, as Dr. Wilf said, people line up according to which camp they're in, and then that energizes the way they're speaking, and we're getting a lot of, a lot of uh, overheated rhetoric. Uh, it's like uh, if you're for the reforms, then you're against democracy. If you're against the reforms, you are for democracy. The other side is saying, no, we're the real Democrats. The people in favor of the reform, reforms are saying, no, we're, we've got a judicial autocracy. Who are these unelected judges? And so I think it's very important to, to try to put the rhetoric aside and to, to discuss the substance of the issues. Having said that, we can't forget the elephant in the room. And that is, you have a government in Israel uh, that replaced a, a, a center, a center left government, but which we now have a right government. And so people uh, who, who didn't vote for this government didn't like it in the first place. And of course, they are choosing uh, any reason uh, uh, to attack it. Uh, you have a government which is made up of the Likud, uh, Shas, the ultra-Orthodox Sephardi party, and then two parties from the religious right. Uh, and together they have uh, 64 seats. And I forgot, of course, the Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox, uh, uh, the uh, Yahadut Torah, the Torah Judaism party. And so you have a coalition of right, religious, and uh, maybe more far right. And, and so, of course, that's turned a lot of people uh, in the international community uh, off this government. Uh, uh, though I think, to be fair, uh, I'm sure in Canada there's a large Italian community. Yes, Italy a few months ago elected a neo-fascist prime minister, I and mean, no one talks about that. Yes, no, and no one says there's a threat to Italian democracy. Uh, and is there really a threat to Israeli democracy? I'm not so sure. I don't believe there is. I believe Israeli democracy is strong. I think we can debate the, the pros and cons of the different judicial reforms put on the table without having to say this is the end of democracy. You can say it's a good idea to, the, to, to, to change the way we, we elect our judges, or it's a bad idea to change the way we elect our judges, appoint our judges, I should say. They're not really elected, they're appointed. Uh, but, uh, but you can argue that without saying if you, the reform goes through, it's the end of Israeli democracy. That, I think, is a, a gross exaggeration and just a function of the polarization of our debate. I'll, I'll take it uh, one, uh, one step forward, uh, uh, Inad and Mark. We know that uh, Israel is, is kind of a unique democracy because lots of statements and uh, public declarations uh, of politicians, mainly in their campaign, but sometimes during governance, and many proposed uh, policies do not marginalize at the end. Do you think that this time with the new government, which, as you mentioned, Mark, has 64 solid uh, mandate majority, it's going to be uh, different? Not. So my, co my colleague, Shani Moore, and myself tried to, uh, in an essay that was published in Haaretz, uh, we tried to look at previous governments and how they were uh, kind of how they were received and what actually happened. So on the positive factor, what we discovered is that all Netanyahu governments, especially the one of 2015, were received with complete hysteria and none of it materialized. Uh, sometimes the exact opposite. Uh, Netanyahu turned out to be much more centrist, careful, uh, generally uh, very much uh, eschewing uh, violence and conflict uh, and even bringing peace agreements as happened with the, in the 2015 government uh, over time. So Netanyahu, if, if you only looked at the Netanyahu factor, you could draw solace from that and say, every time a Netanyahu government was received with hysteria, it was never justified. But then we looked at the 1981 Begin government, which the similarities with this government is that it is a complete right-wing government that has no centrist uh, kind of break. Uh, the 77 Begin government had Dash. The 81 Begin government is, as they say, Yamin Male Male. It was a right-wing government. This is the government of the Lebanon war, uh, really Israel's first, as they say, war of choice and a terrible war at that. It is the government of the runaway inflation. 
It is the government of the runaway settlements. Until that point, settlements are really a very marginal issue. He completely lets the reins loose on settlements. It's the government of runaway uh, Orthodox Jews get, uh, getting money from the government. Again, that was a small issue. He completely let it run loose. So on so many aspects, this was a terrible government that transformed Israel for general, I mean, really transformed Israel, period. And the 1981 election was really brutal and shrill. And, uh, and there's a lot of similarities in the kind of the violence, the intensity, the hatred, the rhetoric comparing to the 1981 election. And you could say in retrospect, they were right. They were right. Begin did destroy the country as they knew it. So as we're trying to look forward, uh, I'm saying Netanyahu on the one hand, you could say, that is a positive factor. But then people are saying, look, it's not the Netanyahu previous government. He's willing to burn the country because of his personal issues. I don't have any insight to that, but a lot of people say that. Uh, but if we compare it to other uh, governments that were purely right wing, especially the Begin 1981 government, then there is a lot to be concerned about. And the people in this government, aside from the Likud, are people, certainly for me, with whom I have nothing in common. And I dread uh, their vision of Israel, certainly on matter of women, of equality, of liberty. Uh, and those are issues for real concern. No, we will we will dive deep into those issue uh, issues in, in a few moments. But Mark, I, I'm, I would like to remind everybody that you work with the with Mr. Netanyahu uh, for many years. I think you know him quite well. And as a not mentioned, he used to be more centric. And I repeat the question, do you think that all the uh, statements which may concerns in Israel and out of Israel, and will touch the uh, Canadian community in, in just a few, a few moments, do you think it will be this time the coalition is determined and will implement the um, uh, reforms on, on the judiciary system, and also we'll get to the state and religion issue with, in a moment. Do you think at this time it's going to be different? Uh, I think it could be. I think it could be. Uh, if we follow Netanyahu uh, since he became prime minister uh, in 2009. The until second he, term. Second term. Uh, but also in his first term, which you covered as a journalist very closely, yeah. Netanyahu always built coalitions that he had someone to the right of him and someone to the left of him. Uh, uh, Dr. Wilf was, was a member of the Labour Party and then a member of the Independence Party, which was a coalition partner of Netanyahu, headed by Ud Barak, which was to the left of Netanyahu. And you had people then who were considered to the right of Netanyahu. Lieberman was once considered to the right of Netanyahu. And uh, you had a, a government that lasted a whole four years, which was a rarity in Israeli politics, where Netanyahu was the prime minister, and uh, uh, Lieberman was the foreign minister, and Ehud Barak from the Labour Party was the defense minister. And I think in many ways for Netanyahu, that was very comfortable, because when you have a coalition partner to the left of you and a coalition partner to the right of you, that allows you to be to be the conductor of the orchestra, so to speak. You can balance one off against the other, and that allows you to, I think, to lead more effectively. As much as Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, says that he's very happy with the current government, that it's a government that represents the right and the majority of Israelis and so forth, uh, my personal opinion is, is that uh, he, it would be advantageous to him I don't know what his opinion is, but it would I believe it would be invested to him that there would be a party from the center or the center left in the coalition as well, as he had in the past. As it wasn't just Ehud Barak. Uh, he had with him Sipi Livni in a coalition. He had with him Yair Lapid in a coalition government. And, 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 and the idea then he could balance left and right, and then he could lead uh, maybe more effectively. Uh, now, the question is, why is that not possible today? And uh, uh, there was a woman, I'm not sure if she served in the Knesset with Dr. Wilf, you will remind me, but Yuli Tamir, who was a founder of Peace Now, uh, an education minister, she was uh, a Labour Party member of Knesset, she wrote a, an op-ed piece in Yerota Chronot a few weeks ago, and she blamed the centre and the centre-left for, for this current government, not that she voted for the parties of the right, but she said, the mere fact that you refuse to go with Netanyahu 
you're not allowing a coalition with a moderate voice. In fact, you've abdicated from the point of view of someone who is more moderate, from the point of view of someone who's on the left. She says you've advoca ad uh, uh, advocated this government. You've given it to the far and radical right. And that is a historic mistake made by the parties of the center and the center left. Inat, would you like to comment uh, briefly on the on the on the on Yuli Tamir's uh, article? She's from your camp, and she has a different opinion. Do you think the reason for the center left and the left not joining the government is purely the uh, the trial of Mr. Netanyahu? Yes, and I do think it's a it's a tragedy, uh, almost in the Greek sense, where there's a fatal flaw, and everyone just does the things that are beyond their control, leading to like hopefully not a lot of bodies on the stage at the end, but it's just this notion that, I mean, the critical moment was when uh, the indictment was put forward to basically say, uh, every person is innocent until proven guilty. Netanyahu has that, uh, I mean, he has the presumption of innocence. And as long as the indictment is public, and there are people who choose to elect him and to give uh, support to the Likud party, knowing the indictment and knowing the data, then we will not be the ones to say that we will not be in government with the Likud under Netanyahu. I definitely think uh, it was a mistake. I'm not of uh, Yuli Tamir's view that we should trade the trial. She basically says, let's just get rid of the trial. Uh, I think it's too late for that. I think of all the terrible choices, the least terrible is to say the trial continues. There is a presumption of innocence. And as long as the trial has not ended, we can be in government with the Likud and with Netanyahu. And as I said, the Israeli society, it enjoys broad agreements. And I think it was important for us to actually take away that wedge issue in order to allow the broad agreements to be manifested in a broad centrist government. So you think we should be part of the coalition, but with Mr. Ben Greer and Mr. Smotrich or replacing the uh, extreme rightist or parties? Of course, replacing. Replacing. Uh, let's move uh, to the uh, Canadian Jewish uh, community in, in this country, which is a very supportive, as we know, and very Zionist community. And, and the community here in Canada hasn't expressed uh, public criticism of uh, any uh, Israeli government, rightist as leftist. Should this approach change? Uh, for instance, Professor Arvin, Arvin Kotler uh, had said this week that, I might quote, passing judicial overall in, in Israel as uh, it would make Israel as a flawed democracy, uh, unquote, of Mr. Uh, Professor Irving. The New York City Federation CEO did express a vocal criticism upon, upon the Israeli government. And I wonder what do you think if, if the Canadian great community should follow? Uh, is there a need of being more visible uh, disagreement, protest, or opposition to uh, uh, any proposed changes in, in Israel right now? Mark, why don't you start right now? So I, I hope to learn something from this discussion because if you look at the judicial reform and if we analyze it more closely, like one of the assumptions, one of the most controversial elements is the idea of an override bill, that a majority in parliament can in fact override a decision of the Supreme Court. And, and maybe some people accept the principle, but they think it should be a larger majority. And at the moment, the proposal is, it's a simple majority of 61. 120 members, 61's a majority, and that's enough to override a Supreme Court decision. And one of the things that's said in Israel by the people who propose that bill is that actually that's the law in Canada. So if the Canadians could tell me if that's the case or not, I'd like to know. Either way, the whole issue of uh, the new rays of diaspora Jews and how vocal they should be. It was said at the beginning of this conversation, and I believe that very carefully, uh, there are people out there who don't like Israel. There are people who don't accept Israel, and it doesn't matter if you support the Labour Party in Israel or you support the Likud in Israel, if you support Smotrich or if you support Meretz. There are people who don't like Israel no matter who, who they, you know, who, who's in power. They didn't like the Lapid government. They didn't like the Bennett government. They didn't like the Perez government. There are people who are just hostile to Israel. And from their perspective, this government is red meat. 
right? For the, they have they have now a talking point, and I think it's important that we uh, and the Jewish communities abroad don't play into their hands. I think it's important. Uh, I think it was said by the the person who introduced us. She said very clearly that there are people out there who will always want to badmouth Israel, and that it's important that communities. Uh, 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 Jewish communities don't play into that uh, to play into that game. Don't help them with with more ammunition. Yes, I do believe though that if and I don't think it, it it's necessarily going to happen. But let's say there are uh, like I heard today. There's a proposal from Shas, the uh, Sephardi Orthodox ultra Orthodox party, uh, to make new restrictions in the Kotel. Uh, no, that was would, by uh, the way, it was denied by the Prime Minister quite a exactly. few hours after that. Correct. That's my point. But I don't think it's not in the coalition agreement. He's got no obligation to support it. But if let's say if Canadian Jews believe it should speak out on Jewish issues, I think that is that's much more legitimate. Yes. But just to blame to the hands of people who are anti-Israel, uh, I think one should be very careful. And what about the uh, Canadians who are deeply concerned about the judiciary reform? Would you expect them to to be silent? Well, I just said, is it possible that in Israel, the most controversial part of the judicial review is the override bill that I discussed? Yeah. Is that not the case in Canada? And, and once again, I think it's also, it depends how you phase the debate, because let's say, let's say we choose the American system and we allow elected officials to be more involved in appointing judges. And that's a separate conversation. So you can say good, bad. But to say it's the end of democracy to have elected officials appoint judges, it happens in, I don't know, 15, at least uh, democracies. And that's why I said at the, in my opening remarks, I talked about because of the polarization, people are using very, very extreme language, maybe on both sides. Is it real? Let's say tomorrow, Israel changes the way we select our judges and there'll be a better role, a uh, more important role, a more enhanced role of elected officials. Is that necessarily, it could be good, it could be bad, we can discuss it, yes, but is it the end of democracy? Instead of having it done in a closed committee to have it done by uh, where politicians have a, have a higher input? Once again, we can debate the pros and cons, but it's the end of democracy to have elected officials have a role uh, to choose judges as in the United States. I think we have to be more balanced on this, how we discuss these issues. I'll turn uh, into, to you, uh, Einat, and I'll add another uh, question which Mark uh, just mentioned. And if the if you think uh, there should be a voice, a clear voice of the Canadian community uh, about the, the issues in Israel, how do the uh, how does the Canadian community ensure that any statements are not exploited by adversaries uh, for to further isolate or marginalize or delegit legitimation of, of the state of Israel? I have to admit that that is the least of my concerns. The reason is that over the years, what I realized is that those that speak against Israel and Zionism don't actually care about facts. So we spend so much time wringing our hands about will we play into what they're saying but what they're saying is so outrageous. There's, you know, they talk about apartheid and they talk about genocide and they talk about ethnic cleansing. So I really cannot see how we can play into their hands. You could almost say comically that if they were to use some of the things that are being part of the debate right now, they would have to admit that Israel was a democracy. Right. Um, I, at one point, I created a kind of two by two chart. I said there's one camp in Israel that says, you know, Israel was not a democracy, but thanks to Levine's judicial reforms, we're finally going to be a democracy. And then there's the other camp that says that we were a democracy until now, but after Levine's judicial reforms, we will no longer be a democracy. And then I kind of said, okay, and there's people like myself who think that precisely because those two other camps are fighting each other, we are pretty much guaranteed to remain a democracy. But Israel's detractors belong in a different rubric where they think that Israel was never a democracy and will never be a democracy. So it's not as if they actually care about the details. And like uh, Mark said, it's not that, you know, uh, with the Lapid government, they said, okay, this is a wonderful government that brings out the best in Israel, but now because of Ben Gvir, it's a terrible government. Zahava Gal'on could have been the prime minister and they, could, they would have still argued that Israel is a settler colonial apartheid genocidal 
uh, white European, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's how they work. So I must say in that sense, uh, that's not my concern. And I don't think that's what should guide us. What should guide us is uh, Jews around the world, as Gail opened, who deeply care about Israel, making their voices heard. Uh, in general, I have no problem. And especially on issues that have to do with how Israel presents itself and acts as a Jewish state. And in that, personally, I would love uh, to have the voices heard. But I don't think we should be concerned about playing into Israel's detractors, because seriously, if I've learned anything, Israel's detractors don't need anything in order to go against Israel. Would you? Can I, can I just respond very quickly, Iran? Yes, sure. I, I just, I'll give a different perspective, okay? When I was the ambassador in the United Kingdom from 2016 to 2014, I mean, Israel had traditional issues with the, with the British. There was always what people perceived, rightly or wrongly, as a very Arabist British foreign office, yes? And then when I was there, I had the unique pleasure. I was the, there when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader of the Labour Party. He was the mm -hmm. prime minister in waiting, and he wasn't known specifically for being particularly pro-Israel, yes? Yeah. And so to say, to say I least. would speak to the local Jews. And the uh, Jewish community in Britain, I'm sure, is very similar to the Jewish community in Canada. And you have people there from left, right, every different perspective, yes? But there, there was an understanding that if the Jewish community, let's say, let's say there's a Jew who, who doesn't support the settlement project over the, over the Green Line. That person speaks out publicly. Yes, it's, it's, you know, you can share your opinion with whoever you want, but when the minute you speak out publicly, are you giving ammunition to people who have a different agenda? In other words, I used, you know, the British Foreign Office can say, well, even the British Jews or, and, and, and of course, people like Mr. Goldman could say, well, even the British Jews. So I, I do think from my experience, the idea that what British Jews said and what Canadian Jews say and what American Jews say, to say that it has no impact, I would be more careful. And this give, this brings me to the to the next question. If people are concerned, and maybe they raise their voice, and the 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 great Canadian community supports Israel along the years in the in the civil society, but by donations um, through the Karen Isod and also the Jewish agency, the organization which I represent to uh, promote different projects in the civil society and different organizations. It's not. Uh, a community which which donate to parties or to a government, uh, obviously. Do you uh, do you feel a, a bit concerned that maybe donors will be uh, affected by this situation in Canada? Are you not? Uh, that's for the Canadian uh, Jewish community to uh, to figure out. Uh, but uh, my personal view is that this is perhaps a time for Jews. Uh, outside Israel to fund more and uh, channel money and efforts to things that have to do not with welfare, but actually with how Israel is Jewish. And I've written a lot about it that uh, Amer uh, American, North American Jews, uh, if they want Israel to be hospitable to their kind of Jewish practice, they, they need to make a stark choice. Uh, they, they can either support religion, but then there's no, you know, there's no really reformed or conservative Jews in Israel, not enough to make a political impact. So if they want to sustain their brand of uh, Jewish life in Israel and to make sure that when they go to the Kotel, they're welcome and that uh, different issues and the immigration, the only uh, allies they have in Israel are secular Jews. A secular Israel will be a more hospitable Israel to various North American religious practices. So, uh, and I think in that respect, I would love to see North American Jews funnel money to efforts to dismantle the chief rabbinate or at least limit it dramatically uh, to turn the Kotel into uh, a Zionist Israeli site rather than a Haredi Beit Knesset or, uh, I mean, I think that would be for me where uh, real valuable impact can be made. Mark? So if I can speak, you, you talked about fundraising and obviously everyone decides what to do with their own money, yes, but 
I would say about fundamental commitment to Israel, this shouldn't matter. It's like if you're Canadian and you didn't vote for the you didn't vote for the particular government that's in in power in 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 Ottawa, you don't stop paying your taxes, yes. And so people who any believe that they have an obligation to be with Israel, so they can choose who to give their money to, obviously. But I don't think that you don't like the the government. I mean, every time that we change our prime ministers, you have to think if you're going to keep with Israel or not. I think we're talking about a connection that's much deeper. Uh, uh, on the contrary. I'll tell you a, a story, Yaron. I, I know I spent more than a decade working with Netanyahu, but I grew up in Habonim. Habonim was on the left. When I made Aliyah, uh, Menachem Begin uh, was prime minister. And I, I remember as a, a young Oleh Chadash, I said, I'm making Aliyah because I want to vote the prime minister out of office. And in my first election, I voted for Mr. Perez. Unfortunately, I was unsuccessful at the time in getting Begin out of office. But at the time, uh, in other words, if you are committed to the country and you don't like the way it's going, so you make an effort to try to push it in the direction you believe, yes? And the best way of doing that, of course, is to be there and make a difference. Uh, I firmly believe that. But there's no reason to disengage. No reason to disengage. On the contrary, if you're worried about what's going on in Israel, you should be more involved. I'd like to, before uh, moving to the next issue, which concerns the, uh, the Canadian community, I'd like to just wrap up the... Uh, the question of the judiciary uh, reform. Uh, right now, it seems uh, unlikely of any dialogue between the two camps, uh, despite the uh, initiative of the president of Israel, Mr. Uh, Itzhak Bouji Herzog. Do you see any chance of a, of a dialogue on, on this issue, on the judiciary reform, uh, Inat? I sincerely think that the whole judiciary reform is uh, a distraction. Something else is going on. Uh, as I said, before it became a personal issue for Netanyahu, very few Israelis cared about it. So there's no question that if the issue itself was just discussed, there would be no uh, problem in achieving uh, a kind of agreed uh, reform. We see it in all the polls. Most Israelis are interested in a kind of compromise. And again, that's uh, the irony, the tragedy that uh, the discourse is so polarized, but all the polls show that the vast majority of Israelis will be happy to see this issue settled. But it appears that Netanyahu is fomenting this issue and I do know from behind the scenes that, you know, uh, there's this game going on as if Yariv Levine is on his own and Netanyahu doesn't control him. It's very clear that he does and Yariv will only do what Netanyahu allows him to do. So clearly Netanyahu wants whatever is happening right now to happen until he gets what he wants. What does he want? Is it the end of the trial? Is it a different government? Is it something else? But in my view, all of what's happening right now will be exchanged for something else that is what that is the thing that he really wants. Mark? I will respectfully disagree with Dr. Wilf. Uh, um, I, I started working for an Israeli prime minister with Zahud Olmert. Oh. And even before he had his own uh, legal issues, he appointed a, a minister of justice uh, called Daniel Friedman who was uh, a judicial minimalist. Yes, he was very much opposed to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the very activist Israeli Supreme Court. In the United States, during the time of the civil rights uh, decisions and so forth, they called, talked about an imperialist, an imperial Supreme Court in, in the United States. I don't know enough about Canada and I apologize, but there's no doubt that the Israeli Supreme Court has been extremely, extremely activist over the last few years. It has taken a lot of power. Um, maybe if you look at Western democracies, Israel has the most activist Supreme Court. And so the, the, this discussion about uh, the, uh, the, the power of the Supreme Court uh, has been going on well before Netanyahu started having their legal issues. And on the contrary, I think since the, the trial with Netanyahu has started, uh, the, the prosecution against him is having trouble proving his case. I don't think he needs them to shut down the case. I think it's going to, uh, from his perspective, the case is going well. Uh, yeah. uh, all I can say is, all I can say is the following: that th I think this is a real issue. In democracy, you have a pendulum, 
right? And, and, and there's the executive branch and there's the judiciary and sometimes it goes this way and sometimes it goes this way. The Supreme Court in Israel has taken so much power over the last few years. I remember when I was in the Foreign Service, uh, there was an, a political appointment by the Foreign Minister, David Levy. This is going back, what, uh, 10 years, 20 years almost. And it was taken to the Supreme Court. Is this a logical choice for the, prior, for the Foreign Minister to appoint this man ambassador somewhere? I don't even remember where the case was. Maybe it was somewhere to Canada. And, and the, the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case. And that means they could have theoretically told the foreign minister, you can't make this appointment. Now, this is really micromanagement by the judiciary of the executive branch. And that the, there, there is blowback that people are saying this is too much. I think, I think is, is natural. It's good we're having the debate. I hope we can reach compromises, but I do believe judicial reform is important. And I would like to uh, to uh, take a question from the audience, which deals with another popular issue here here in Canada, the proposed the uh, proposed policies and rhetoric to uh, that counter to the Western values in in general, uh, equality, diversity, inclusion, uh, the rights of LBGQ. Uh, LBGTQ, and do you see Israel turning um, its back to liberalism and um, what could be the effect of the uh, on the Canadian liberal uh, community in that sense? A not. So this is the paradox of Israeli democracy. Israeli democracy, as it stands now, is more inclusive, more representative of a greater diversity of voices than it has been probably throughout its history. But that means that more non-liberal voices are represented than ever before. And even the idea of liberalism is relatively new as a mark of kind of elements of uh, Israeli democracy. The paradox of Israeli democracy is actually very few of the participants in Israel's democracy are Democrats in the sense that we think about it, of their values. Uh, sometimes I joke, but not too much, that like everything good that ever existed in Israel, our democracy is the result of no choice. Our democracy is not the result of some kind of ideals of founding fathers. Our democracy is the result of lack of choice. It's simply the only mechanism that all the groups in Israeli society had in order to arbitrate their fierce disagreements about the kind of country Israel was going to be and is. So very few participants, I will even admit to my camp, my camp calls itself right now the liberal. If I'm being truthful, we are still the same old Bolsheviks we ever were. Basically saying, we're sorry, this is the country we established, it's secular, and that's how we want it to remain. Uh, and it doesn't matter if democratically there is a majority for those who want it to be much more subject to religious law. So I think actually very few of Israel's participants in its democracy are uh, kind of abstractly Democrats. We right. are a democracy of people who are fighting for different visions. That means that if the people with the less liberal vision, more religion in the public sphere, uh, less recognition of different streams, uh, more religious study, uh, then Israel might backslide on those values and I think much of the battle right now is not over democracy, but over the question of what kind of Jewish state Israel will be. And before turning to you, I'd like to add a question uh, on the chat from Sarah Dobner, who, who asked, what would you say to diaspora Jews who may be very committed to Israel, very committed, but are very worried about the belief that the government of Israel is uh, run by corrupted and religious uh, members. What would you say to them? So, so I, I would say the following. First thing that needs to be said is that uh, I want to take Dr. Wilf's point and, and make it even stronger. Uh, there's this 
you know, nostalgia is always good, right? People look back at the good old days when everything was wonderful. The idea that Israel in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s was a liberal pluralist country is just not true, right? In many ways, we are a one-party state uh, uh, the, uh, run by the Labour Party in its previous ma manifestations, Mapai and so forth. Uh, it, it was, uh, the media was not particularly uh, uh, biting. Yes, it was a much more conformist society. Uh, 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 it was difficult for, for uh, gays, it was difficult for women, it was a society that was more closed, it was difficult for Mizrahim, yes, there, there were all these issues. Today, I have no doubt, if you look at the trajectory, Israel is more liberal, more pluralist, more open, more free than ever before. Now, is this new government about to change all that? Well, uh, take the issue that you raised, Yaron, uh, 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 which was the issue of uh, the LGBT community. You had, an, um, I think, a, a, a very Israeli moment when the Speaker of the Knesset was uh, sworn in mm -hmm. uh, and he introduced his, his male partner and mm -hmm. their, their children. And he was supported in a vote because they were forced to by coalition difference. Uh, the anti-gay ultra-Orthodox voted for this Speaker of the Knesset. And I think this is the, I mean, uh, we've, had, uh, we've had LGBT ministers before, but this, this, the Speaker of the Knesset is one of the ceremonial roles of Israel. It's a very high profile position. It is like our vice president in many ways, uh, to use the American system. The Speaker of Parliament, it's a very important position in Israel. And it is now being held by a man who is openly and proudly LGBT. And once again, it, it was done in the ceremony. And I don't know how all these Haredi people feel when, when, when he pointed in his speech, he talked about his partner and about their children. Uh, and, and I think this was a, maybe a, a description or a presentation of Israeli paradoxes, yes? Uh, but the idea that somehow the LGBT community is, is going to have its rights taken away, Netanyahu said publicly, uh, uh, even before the coalition agreements were signed, he will not allow anyone to touch the, the rights of the LGBT community. And I think it's, it's crucial to understand that uh, the Likud, it says uh, 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 on the Likud membership card, it says a national liberal party. And they might be more Republican than Democratic, but they're the liberal wing of the Republican party when it comes to these social issues. Mm -hmm. I don't think Israel's pluralist and liberal uh, 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 society is, is under threat. And this is a, an excellent bridge to the to the topic of the uh, relationship of Israel and the diaspora, because there are initiatives to change the Israeli law of return, uh, to change the conversion process into much more orthodox one. And uh, the ultra orthodox parties and the Zionist religious party push for all these changes. And I wonder, uh, do you see it happening? Or do you see Mr. Netanyahu trying to block it? And if it continues and changes with all these changes, what could be the implication in the Israel, uh, important, I would say, Israel diaspora relationship? Inat. So one of the things uh, that's happening is a kind of reopening of old understandings. So I participated in a discussion that happened in the Knesset a couple of weeks ago, precisely on this issue of the grandchild, the so-called grandchild clause of uh, the immigration law, the law of return. And what was emphasized there is that that clause is the result of a historic compromise from 1970 between religious people who wanted to go much more in the halachic orthodox definition of a Jewish person and the secular who did not. And this was a compromise. And one of the main things that was repeated in the discussion, and I think it's an overarching theme that for everything that's happening right now, that if you're going to reopen old compromises with the intention of moving them to the more halachic, Haredi, orthodox direction, then essentially all hell breaks loose because you're reopening all the compromises and don't expect the secular side to just kind of say, okay, fine. Uh, and I think, again, this is part of what we're seeing uh, right now in, in the tensions. Um, and this is, again, why my recommendation for Jews from around the world is to actually 
put their thumb on the scale for a more secular Israel, because those are the two forces that are battling and those will determine where the compromises lie. So I think we're going to see this coalition and this government trying to reopen a lot of old compromises, but I think what they'll find out is that as they seek to do so, there will be very powerful counterforce that will prevent them from going in that direction. And before uh, you you make your comments, Mark, I'll add the uh, uh, question of Deb Hatch from the uh, from the chat. Do you think uh, it, it do you think it is realistically speaking inevitable that the uh, non-liberal or an anti-secular vision will become dominant due to the to the numbers and i would add to the influence of the the parties in, in the coalition regarding uh, as i said before the relationship between israel and the left and all the initiatives to change the laws including the law of return which is very very important for jewish communities around the world so as we saw with what we spoke about a moment ago uh, I talked about that Chus had this legislation, and you correctly said before I could have a chance to say it that Netanyahu said he's not going to support this. First of all, there'll be all sorts of initiatives, but the government won't support them unless he has to, right? And, and whatever's not in the coalition agreement, he's not going to, he's not obligated to do. And because he's a seasoned politician, I wouldn't be sure that everything, every item in the coalition agreement will put in, will be pushed forward as quickly as some of the ultra-Orthodox would want. But we're talking about a process in Israel that's been going on for quite some time. When I made Aliyah, I made Aliyah from Australia in 1982. I just showed up with a letter from an Aliyah Shaliyah, maybe a bit like uh, what you do today, you're on. And it was acceptable at, at the Ministry of the Interior. And I was given a tour at Zahut and everything was fine. My brother came on Aliyah a few years after me. And he had to already was asked to bring a letter from his rabbi to show that he was Jewish. So we're talking about things that have been happening in Israel for quite, uh, it's, it's not new under this government, right? And, uh, uh, but I would argue also that it's not a one-way street. We're seeing some very interesting things happen in Israel. When I was a student at the Hebrew University in the mid 1980s, if you wanted to go out for dinner on a Friday night, yes, you had to go to the Eastern part of the city to an Arab restaurant. Now in, 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 in Jewish Jerusalem, yes, on a Friday night, you have all sorts of places you can go to. The whole idea that Israel is becoming only more religious, more Haredi, more Orthodox, it's just not true. It's just not true. Uh, 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 and the, I, I know that many, not many Israelis would publicly identify with the reform or the conservative movements. But I can't tell you how many times I go to the funeral of someone and the rabbi officiating his reform, or I go to a bar mitzvah of someone's children who are having a bar mitzvah, and it's a reform rabbi, many secular Israelis are opting for uh, non-Orthodox Judaism and, and, in a, and over the last decade more than ever before. So we're seeing the complex. If you read the headlines of the newspapers, one just thinks Israel every day is becoming more ultra-Orthodox. It's not true. The picture is much, much more complex. But if, and correct me if I'm, I'm, if I'm wrong. My impression, Mark, for what you said, that Mr. Netanyahu, as the driver of this, I would say, train, will use the uh, brake paddle quite quite a bit um, to stop and block initiatives from other parties who might be a bit more extreme, including the question of the grandchild clause, the uh, the orthodox uh, way of conversion. Am I am I right? So the orthodox way of conversion, unfortunately, Israel. That's the way it is in Israel at the moment. Yes. Um, no, I'm, and you yeah, but the out, of, out of his out of Israel, you know, the, the reform and conservative are valid. Of course, I I, I know that. Uh, mm. uh, I would say that you've got this interesting situation. Let's like, say in Israel, if you are Aulei Hadash, and the Soknut has recognized you, right? You can come to live in Israel, but the Rabbanut, which is Orthodox, won't marry you unless you're Orthodox, unless you can prove that you're halachically Jewish. We've been living with these contradictions for years. Uh, and uh, I would always, uh, when I would speak to, uh, as ambassador in London, when I would speak to non-Orthodox communities, uh, progressive uh, Judaism and others, the Masorti community, I would always say you should make your voice uh, made uh, felt in Israel. It's very important. Uh, I can quote Netanyahu, who said on more than one occasion, 
that Israel wasn't created for a particular stream in, in Judaism. It was not created for Orthodox Jews. It was not created for liberal Jews. It was not created for conservative Jews. It was not created for reform Jews uh, or for reconstructionist Jews. Israel was created for all Jews and all Jews should feel at home in Israel. And I think that is his overwhelming uh, outlook. To what extent will there be political pressures put for him to move in a direction that's not naturally his? Of course, they'll be there. And that's why I said, it's important that diaspora communities on these issues, I think it's yeah. important that they, they make their opinion heard. I'd like to use uh, both of you political experience and excellent senses to try to um, anticipate how will, will this battle going to end? And will there be any compromise between the two camps or the 64 coalition will use the majority to move forward on the judiciary system, on the uh, question of, of uh, state and religion. How do you see this battle going to end, Einat? So first I'll say that I feel deeply uncomfortable with putting everything on Netanyahu. Netanyahu will put the brakes. Netanyahu is the moderate. I mean, that's not how politics works, uh, okay. certainly not in coalitions and not in parliaments. And uh, one does have to admit that half of this government has a very particular view of Judaism, of women, of the hierarchy of men and women, of the hierarchy of Jews and non-Jews, which, and you know, we can't just put everything on Netanyahu to put the brakes. Um, what I'm trying to compare this moment, and I will admit it's wishful thinking on my behalf, but let's engage in it, is to what happened with annexation. Uh, if you recall, uh, on the eve of the supposed annexation, everyone was going nuts. And I remember participating like this in numerous panels and big land grabbing evil Israel is about to annex everything. And then the ambassador of the UAE to the US said, hi Israelis, do you want direct flights to Dubai? And everyone was like, hell yeah. And annexation was dropped in a heartbeat. And except for five settlers who said, oh, this is a, a terrible lost opportunity, most Israelis couldn't care. I feel there's a similar, I feel similarly about the judicial reform. I think if you tell Israelis tomorrow, look, we're gonna pass these elements, but not these elements, and this is what we're gonna do, I think most Israelis will like, sure, whatever. I, I do think a lot of the passions now around these issues are inflamed and it will be for something else. Uh, so this is my wishful positive thinking. I will admit uh, that's on my good days, but every day now I have a day when I wake up uh, feeling good. And then some days I'm deeply, deeply concerned because this energy that is building up on both camps, at one point you have to say, well, this energy will have to be released and it often gets released in a violent way in, in the 1981 government, there was the Emil Grinzweig uh, assassination, and there was the Rabin assassination, and there were moments when such things released themselves in violence, and then the sides kind of caught themselves and said, okay, we went too far. So I genuinely and sincerely hope that all this energy that is building up, all this negative energy, could be released in the way that it was with annexation and not in the way that it was with Oslo or with the Lebanon war. So Mark, before you answering the question, how, how do you think it's gonna end? How worried are you from, of the, of the toxic and uh, environment that uh, valid right now in Israel? We see it clearly in the, in the, the different social uh, networks. We see it sometimes in the rhetoric in the Knesset, uh, there are some expressions we, we haven't heard before uh, almost into uh, physical violence from, from time to time, which is very, very troubling. So how much are you concerned from this kind of a toxic environment and how do you see this battle ends? So first of all, I don't know how it's going to end. I can tell you what I hope for. I hope that, uh, I hope that a judicial reform moves forward and hopefully it will get a consensus that there'll be, I think Netanyahu next week, the government needs to have it passed in the first reading of the bill. And once that they've shown that they've got the numbers, maybe, maybe the uh, it can be opened up for discussion. 
I mean, if you turn, let's say, if you take the, the most controversial part of the, the bill, which is the apparently the Canadian system, which means Parliament can overrun, uh, override the, the Supreme Court with a simple majority. So if you tell people 61, they don't like it. If you say, well, 68, 72, maybe, they, in other words, I think there's room for talk. It's room to maybe to build a stronger consensus. I hope it is possible. But I'm like, uh, and that will, I'm, I, on some days, I am, I am, I am skeptical. The politics in Israel today is so pl uh, polarized. Um, can people in the center really move out of the, the bubble they're in and, and try to make a deal with this government? Lapid uh, made a statement, as you know, a few uh, weeks ago, saying that he uh, was willing for a compromise and he was attacked viciously by other people in his own camp saying he's a traitor. And Barack has attacked the president for proposing compromises. Yes, uh, which is, it's all crazy. I hope, I hope we can achieve a compromise. I hope it's possible to do judicial reform. I really believe as someone who's been in government, who sit in the, in the cabinet room, uh, 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 elected officials have to be held accountable before the voters. Now we need an independent judiciary. Mm -hmm. But our judiciary in Israel is really extra super activist. Uh, I gave one example, I can give much more. And the idea that we would change the way we appoint judges, just one thing, though, I'm, I'm not sure our Canadian friends have, are aware of this, but like the Israeli Bar Association has two votes uh, on, the, on this small selection committee. And the Bar Association has been tainted by all sorts of scandals, one after the other, uh, uh, not necessarily the best lawyers go into this sort of politics inside the Bar Association. The idea that that should be taken away and given to someone else is something I think most Israelis would support. Well, I wonder, uh, Einat, what, what mechanisms are uh, in place in Israel that uh, promote equality among Israel's diverse citizens? And where should uh, improvements be made and how uh, are the concerns with with the new with the new government on those issues? So I have to admit that I've studied and looked into judicial ideas in one way or another, and I remain agnostic on the issue. Uh, I don't think it's gonna. I don't think Israel was not a democracy because of the Supreme Court, and now thanks to Levin, it will be, and vice versa. I can say that as a politician. I think all of it is one huge excuse for an action. I've seen politicians use the convenient excuse of a powerful judiciary to actually kind of load off accountability. The Knesset always had the power. This is where the power is. The Knesset could have always legislated things to override. I've seen again and again members of Knesset use this as a convenient excuse. So I don't think this issue in one way or another is going to change anything about Israel's democracy. Israel's democracy rests on, first of all, the fact that it has a solid Jewish majority. The Jews, the argumentative Jews have a very solid history and culture of argumentation, of debate, the Zionist movement, this is what's going to guarantee our democracy, the fact that we're a parliamentary system, where parliamentary systems, much more than presidential systems, tend to sustain democracies. So in that sense, again, I'm not concerned for Israel's democracy. I am deeply concerned for what kind of Jewish state Israel will be. And mm -hmm. for that, I think we need to battle on the content of it rather than the structures. But the structure of Israel's democracy guarantee equality, equality before the law. Israel is the most one of the most representative democracies on earth. But as I said, the paradox of Israeli democracy is that the more representation it has, the more illiberal voices it also has. Mm -hmm. So it's a democracy, we just need to make sure that there are more voices for our vision, at least for me, my vision of what a Jewish state is, mm -hmm. rather than other visions. I think, Mark, you can uh, partially agree with with a not on on the on, on these on the, this question. Yeah, I do. I do. I think. Uh, uh, I think uh, she, Dr. Wolf, opened 
And she said uh, in her introductory remarks that actually there's a huge consensus in Israel, right? So if it was possible theoretically to take the politics out of it, I think mm -hmm. you could build a program of judicial reform and you could get 85, 90 members of the Knesset to support it, right? Yep. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but the politics today is toxic, very, very difficult. Uh, uh, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but it's similar to what goes on today in the United States. No, this is not the and case in Canada. No, well, I'm gl glad to hear Canadians have always been known to be nice people, yes? yes. In Israel, the politics is very... But I have to tell you now, it's interesting, we've got this terrible earthquake now in Turkey and in Syria, yes? Yeah. And you see the nice part of Israel coming out, yes? The volunteers going there, the people donating, and all this. This country is still a great country, yes? Uh, the politics might be a bit uh, uh, crazy at the moment, but it's still a great country, as anyone who visits can see. My, my my next question relates to a totally uh, different issue, which we haven't touched, but I would like to add to my question, uh, a question of Judy Shapiro on the chat. Um, I find it interesting that no one has mentioned the uh, Palestinians in this discussion, and this is our next topic. And she says, uh, does it mean that the Israeli public uh, is comfortable with the human rights abuses in the disputed territories? And that the two-state solution is actually dead that's the question of the uh judy of judy shapiro on on the chat and brother is where do you see this palestinian israeli conflict right now and when the right-wing government is being in, in in government mark maybe you will start with it so judy asked the question i will I'll respond directly to judy i, I don't see a lot of change happening hmm. uh, I think the interesting thing about the Palestinian issue is uh, we just had elections, as Yaron said, on the 1st of November, we had elections in Israel. Even the Israeli left doesn't want to talk about Palestinians. I remember three days before the, demo, uh, the elections, it, it was the end of October, I was driving out of where I live and Meretz, which, as we know, didn't even get into the Knesset, but they were the party of the traditional Zionist left, the party of peace now. The, the, and I was watching, they were demonstrating and giving red roses to drivers to encourage people to vote for merits. And there was not a single poster that talked about peace with the Palestinians or a two-state solution. It was all about uh, the issues we've been discussing. And I think we need to ask this question, why is it, forget that the, you know, the, the Israeli right doesn't want to talk about Palestinians. Why is it that the Israeli left wants to talk about everything else, judicial reform, economy, religion and state, all these issues, but they don't want to talk about Palestinians. And I think the, the, the truth is most Israelis just don't believe anything can happen anytime soon. Most Israelis believe the Palestinians, you know, that uh, I use the word, I talk about, uh, there was a Soviet leader called Brezhnev, yes. who was like an old man and he, nothing could happen. And the whole Soviet system listened, it got into stagnation until Gorbachev came and opened everything up, yes? so. A bus today on the West Bank, it, it's, it's Brezhnevization. The Palestinian system is stuck. Nothing's going to happen. So most Israelis would say, let's just try to keep it quiet until maybe something breaks in the future. But is it possible? I mean, if people do not ignore it, and just a second, uh, Inat, you'll be, I'm sure you have a lot to say about it, I'm sure. But Mark, if people don't talk about it, does it mean that the conflict disappeared or can be ignored? Or there will be, or there be another surprise um, in the future that nobody predicts. Look, we could have a war with Gaza tomorrow because of Hamas. Yeah. But what are you going to do with Hamas in the first place? Hamas doesn't, you know, Hamas doesn't care if you vote for Meretz or for Likud. You're, you're still a terrible Zionist, right? That's Hamas. The West Bank, it's pretty dysfunctional. What can you do? So from a point of view of policy, right? You've got to try to keep things quiet. Can you do economic things? Can you try to build different realities on the ground? But the whole idea that there's a two-state solution just waiting to happen, and all Israel has to do is elect the right person and press the magic button, most Israelis would tell you that's a pipe dream. It's not going to happen. Your turn, Ainat. You were waiting this is actually the very issue. patiently. Oh, sorry? You were just waiting very passionately, uh, patiently, and I'm sure you have a lot to say. Patiently and passionately. Um, so uh, this is actually the issue where there's the a wide agreement uh, between Israelis, because what Israelis realized as a result of uh, the 90s, as a result of the 
early 2000s where Palestinian leaders, Arafat and later Abu Mazen, walked away from perfectly good opportunities to have an independent state with no settlements, with capital in East Jerusalem, followed by waves of massacres and violence, most Israelis concluded correctly that unfortunately the Palestinians remain very much attached to a foundational ethos, which is the basis of their identity and enjoys a wide consensus without dissenting voices, uh, that as a top priority for Palestinians, it is more important that the Jews not have their state then the Palestinians have the state in part of the land. So as long as the conflict is between a Palestinian people, not their leaders, a people who are deeply committed to the idea of from the river to the sea, then really doesn't matter right wing or left wing in Israel because no Israeli position, which insists on a Jewish state, even in part of the land will be acceptable to Palestinians. So in that sense, most Israelis understand that at the moment there is no solution in the sense that the Palestinians have not yet uh, parted with over a century of anti-Zionism and that anti-Zionism, the idea that no Jewish state is acceptable in any part of the land remains the absolute top priority and key defining element of their identity. So once that is understood, the question then remains, uh, what can we do in the interim? Sometimes I say that the conflict is actually quite simple. It's more than a century long battle of mutual exhaustion where the Arabs and especially the Palestinians are trying to get the Jews to forgo Zionism. And we are trying to get the Arabs to finally forgo anti-Zionism. So as this battle of mutual exhaustion continues, uh, what can be done, and that at least Netanyahu has been very good in the past, is at least control the level of violence. Uh, so I am not concerned on the big question. The day that a Palestinian leader will come to the Jewish people and say, we have ended our century long battle against Zionism. We recognize the Jewish people as a historical equal claimant to this land. And we only want to live next to you rather than instead of you. We understand that means we don't demand return and such things. At that moment, we will realize that Israel has not moved to the right. That there is a vast majority, including voters of the Likud, who will support a partition and a two-state solution. But we need to know that Palestinians have ended their battle against Zionism. So on that, I'm not concerned. When that happens, they will find that Israel, as Israel always has, when it met with a serious peace partner, Israel always said yes. What I am concerned is that there are elements in Netanyahu's coalition, especially the so-called religious Zionists, who actually understand that most of Israelis don't care for the vision of the settlements and for annexation. And we saw it. Israelis were happy to forgo annexation for normalization with the UAE. The Israeli public was always centrist and prioritized having a Jewish state over messianic visions of more land. The religious Zionists know that, and as a result, I think some of them believe that fomenting violence, creating chaos, reshuffling the cards through violence will somehow help their cause. And this for me is an issue of concern on the more immediate level. And it takes me to a question about anti-Semitism around the world. And, and there, was, there is some, unfortunately, anti-Semitism also in, in Canada. Uh, we saw a rise in the anti-Semitism following the uh, Guardian of the, of the Wall on, on May 2021. And uh, there is a question of, of Howard uh, on the chat. Why doesn't Israel respond to toxic international criticism on this issue uh, of, of anti-Semitism, for instance? And I wonder if you think the, um, the situation right now in, in Israel could be affected, could, could affect the, the rise of anti-Semitism uh, around the world or not necessarily, Mark? 
So uh, I know from my time in the United Kingdom that you can get spikes of anti-Semitism when there's violence uh, between us and our neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, British Jews will tell you whenever there's a war in Gaza, even though Israel doesn't want those wars, even though that Israel does its best to avoid those wars, uh, that you will see a spike in anti-Semitism. And uh, uh, I'm not aware, though, that you see that sort of spike because of political things. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen that in the past. Um, what, 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 what I saw in London is you see anti-Semitism, I'm sure it's similar in Canada, it comes from the traditional far right, yes, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, neo-Nazi sort of uh, anti-Semitism. You see it from Islamists who tend to be anti-Semitic as well, and you see it on the very, very far left, the, the Jeremy Corbyn phenomena that I saw in, in, uh, in uh, Britain. I would say the following, right? If there was once a, a belief, my father was a Holocaust survivor. If there was a belief once after the Holocaust that humanity had finally learned its lesson, yes, that, that, that they saw where this hatred leads and suddenly the world would wake up and say anti-Semitism is a terrible thing and we have to expunge it, yes? That, that unfortunately has not happened. That's a myth. And, mm -hmm. and so you could be very cynical and you could say, well, some things don't change. Uh -huh. But something has changed, Euron. Something very important has changed. And unlike my father, when he was a child and the Jews were stateless and defenseless and knocking on people's doors, please let me in so they won't kill me, yes? Today, we can be proudly say that if something has changed, the Jews have changed. We have a state. We have a successful state. With all our problems, Israel is a very successful country politically, economically, diplomatically, militarily, we can protect ourselves. And that if you look at all the 20th century revolutions, whether the Bolshevik revolution or the Arab revolution or, or the different revolutions that we saw, Zionism, the Zionist revolution, the revolution that we brought about in the fate of the Jewish people, that we can now defend ourselves by ourselves. And if a Jew in the Ukraine or a Jew in Russia or a Jew in France feels persecuted, that they don't have to sit there and take it, that they have the ability, yes, to go and live in Israel or that Israel will speak up and defend their interests, that is the huge change. May not. So to, to me, it goes to the question of is rising anti-Semitism, and I think at least here, we all tend to agree that uh, anti-Zionism has become the respectable mass behind which uh, it is possible to approach and assault Jews in the places where they are, uh, such as campuses and media and academia. Uh, the question is, does rising anti-Semitism ever, is ever about the Jews uh, and what the Jews do? And I think by now we have enough of history to uh, make the resounding answer of no. Rising anti-Semitism, however it's manifested, is always an indication of a crisis in the society where the anti-Semitism rises. Um, the famous sociologist René Girard, who studied scapegoating, said that societies in crisis can ask two questions, what to do or who to blame. Mm -hmm. And societies that emerge best from crises ultimately answer what to do. But there is a real need often in societies for who to blame. And there's no doubt that the Jews are on the shelf as ready-made, reliable scapegoats. Uh, you know, if there's one thing you can rely on on times of uncertainty and crisis is that the Jews did it. Uh, so I think we can wring our hands about what we did and what we're saying and what is Israel. And again, this goes to my argument wh whether why I don't think uh, that we're giving uh, ammunition to those against us, because those who are against us are not really responding to the Jews and to the actions of the Jews. They are responding to the crises in, our, in their societies. And mm -hmm. therefore, the questions we need to ask is what is wrong in the society where this is rising rather than what is wrong with the Jews. And here, of course, I agree with Mark, there's a great phrase by Ephraim Tishon, really the best there ever was in terms of our 
defining what Israel is, he said, um, unfortunately, unlike what Herzl hoped, uh, Israel did not cure the world of its anti-Semitism, but it did give the Jews the option to tell the anti-Semites to shove it. So let's live with that. Uh, we, we are, <laughs> thank you. Einat, uh, uh, Gail Markovitz in her opening remarks uh, did mention the Abraham Accord, and I want to ask one question, which I think related to to the uh, next step of the Abraham, Abraham Accord. I think it's quite clear that Mr. Netanyahu would love to move forward towards any kind of an agreement, open agreement with Saudi Arabia, and this was was on on the agenda with with President Trump, and uh, with the new government, I think it's going to be one of the initiatives of the Prime Minister. For that. Uh, he might need the U.S. administration to pay a price to the Saudi uh, kingdom. Once the administration, the Biden administration, is not happy with the uh, reforms, could the uh, Mr. Netanyahu see uh, President Biden and the administration as a great partner to promote the uh, Saudi initiative? Or there might be a link between the debate in Israel about all the reforms and the wish of the prime minister to move forward with the Saudi regime. Mark. So actually, we had two pieces of good news just in the last week, and I'm sure part of the participants in this conversation know about it. We had movement with Chad, where the president of Chad was here. Chad is not an Arab country, but it's a Muslim country, a very large Muslim country in, in Africa. It borders Libya, and it uh, opened an embassy in Israel last week. And that is uh, an amazing achievement. And we're, uh, I'm not saying Chad's the most important country in the world. It's probably not, but it's nice that they're there. There was also, uh, with Sudan, also a breakthrough. Uh, our foreign minister was in discussions with the Sudanese. That was one of the four Abraham Accords countries. It was stalled for a while because of political things inside Sudan. And that is moving too. Sudan maybe also is not the most important Arab country, but it's moving. It shows that there is movement in the right direction. Sudan has maybe symbolic importance because we all remember the famous three no's from Khartoum, yes? No to recognition, no to peace, no to Israel. Or what was the third? No, no to negotiations, I'm sorry. Yeah. No to negotiations, no to peace. Uh, and so forth. So uh, uh, it's nice to see this is going on. I think the Abraham Accords, this normalization with the Arab world is crucial. I expect it to continue. I expect to see more Arab and more Muslim states normalize ties with Israel. Uh, the big prize, as you say very correctly, Iran, is Saudi Arabia. How quickly that happens, I'm not sure. You are correct when you say that also depends on the Saudi U.S. relationship, which is not in a good place today. You did say something, if I'm allowed to disagree with you, Ron, with, with your permission and with respect. Sure. You said the reform bill in Israel on the legal system could affect the way American policy deals with Israel. I'm not so convinced. No, I just I'm, mentioned to, 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 to what the Secretary of State visited in Israel. No, no, no. I, 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 having been in the room... Having been in the room uh, uh, when serious things are discussed, there are peripheral issues and there are central issues, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I really, uh, it's, it's a nice thing to, to put a bit of pressure on the government and to speak out, yes, but is this really an issue that's central? I tend to be skeptical. Are you not? So certainly uh, more and more in the last years, uh, uh, the optimism uh, comes from changes in the Arab world rather than things that are happening in the West. Mm -hmm. Netanyahu has not made it a secret that he's very interested in moving forward with Saudi. That is indeed the big prize that will enable to argue that the Israeli-Arab conflict is finally over. It will turn countries like Algeria and others that are anti-Israel into laggards rather than uh, within the, cons the Arab consensus. But Saudi knows that, and Saudi has a shopping list. Most of it, of course, is from the United States. But it also will expect uh, Israel to at least support some kind of Palestinian state, any 80% of the territory. Something will also have to go on that front. And in that, by the way, I'm optimistic that certainly we could voters if Netanyahu will say this is on the table, they will definitely say yes. The problem is, of course, that 
half or at least the a third, the Zion, the religious Zionists don't want that and have every interest in fomenting violence precisely because they understand what the price will be of such normalization. And Saudi is not gonna move forward quickly if it does not get much, if not all of what it wants from the United States and from Israel. So it's on the table, but I can tell you in discussions with Saudis, they're all saying caution, we hear these voices from Israel. You seem to be engaging in magical thinking. It's not happening so quickly. But let's try to be uh, optimistic. I, I would like to... Always. <laughs> yes, always. That's true. Um, <laughs> that's about the uh, all the time we have uh, uh, this afternoon. And I'd like to thank the two of you, Dr. Einat uh, Wilf and uh, Ambassador Mark Regev. It was fascinating talking to you on this webinar. And thanks for joining me on the, on this, uh, offering your insights, your thoughts, your knowledge. And I do hope our uh, Canadian friends can uh, walk away with a little more context about the, the new government and the situation in Israel and the feelings inside and outside of the uh, of the Jewish state and what is the road ahead looks like. Um, thank you again for the uh, the Center of Israel and Jewish Affairs, Sija, for initiating and coordinating this. And uh, should anyone uh, in the audience have uh, more questions, we invite you to reach out to the CJA website, www.cija.ca. Uh, later this afternoon, uh, you'll receive a follow-up survey to help CJA better understand how uh, they can continue the important uh, advocacy work on behalf of uh, uh, your on your behalf, and. Uh, we are all encourage you to fill it uh, out. Thank you ever, again, everyone, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you, Sija. Thank you.